We move on to abstract classes and we revisit the virtual keywords now. Now abstract classes, I think you've known already, or many of you know already, if you're a computer scientist, you've probably seen this already in Java or perhaps even Python. And uh, abstract classes are, again, a type of class that in C don't really explicitly exist, where they, whereas they do in other languages. But in C, they are defined as a normal class in a particular way, and this particular way lets us interpret this as an abstract class. Now, abstract classes, this is what the first line says, and that's the truth, uh, are defined as classes that cannot be instantiated. So you can never create an object of an abstract class. That is, the, by definition, what an abstract class should be. Um, and in C++, you can define this by having one or at least one method in the class that you declare as a pure, pure virtual method uh, or an abstract method. And pure virtual methods use the virtual keyword, but that's something we've done before, and that was not an abstract class. The real deal is the fact that it's a pure virtual function is that this equals zero is at the end, and that we don't uh, implement this method at all. So that means if we create a class and we create in one of it, as a, one of its methods a pure virtual function or a pure virtual method, then there won't be any implementation there. And because of that, it's then also logical that you can't create any objects of this particular class. It's an abstract class, so you can't create a specific object because of that object would be able to call this thing which is not implemented yet. And that would be very hard for a compiler to do, to call something that is not implemented yet. So therefore, um, the, the goal of an abstract class is not that you just have this class and that's it, but that you then inherit from this class. And the fact that you inherit from this class is kind of like a contract. It's a promise that you will implement this particular method. And if you don't, then this inherited class is also an abstract class. And you basically can do this until you inherit and you do override this particular method. You do implement it in the end. And only then you have a class from which you can create objects, which is, I think, sensible because otherwise they would have this virtual method that is not there yet. Right? So that is, that is the, uh, per definition, what an abstract class is. This might seem a little bit strange because why would you go through the effort of creating so many classes um, that are all abstract and uh, don't implement any methods. Well, this is again a very similar construct like the header file in, in the C or C++. It shows you we have thought of a, of a method uh, or we have thought of a class using a particular method, but it could be that there, are very, that there are multiple specific ways to implement this method. We just want to unify it in a way that everybody will now uh, use this method in the same way. That, for instance, this method always return this particular type. Or that this method will always use these particular parameters. So you make sure that the signature of this particular function over here, in this case, it doesn't have any parameters and it doesn't return anything, but it could be you know, anything else, that this signature is defined by this abstract class. And this abstract class is therefore dictating what the child classes can do with this particular method. They can override it, or they have to override it, uh, before an object of that uh, class can be uh, created. So in a way, it can also be a way uh, to communicate between different developer teams. Like one developer could say, I have thought of a really nice uh, method of a part of this class. And if you want to implement and use all of this, you can, or you have to implement this particular method this way. And so that it kind of forces child classes to follow this procedure. And on the sa same side, it basically also uh, forces them to implement these uh, methods. So that's the idea. Um, Right. The same way that abstract classes cannot be instantiated, so you can make uh, objects, uh, they also can be used as parameter types, so you can't pass them in a function, which is quite important. So um, it's not like what we saw with polymorphism, there you would be able to have the base class uh, being instantiated or pointed to the base class. In this case, this would not, um, uh, uh, or the, the pointer would be possible, but the, the, the class itself not. Uh, you can't have them as return types, uh, you can't convert to them, 
uh, you can have pointers or references to them and do something like the polymorphismic uh, thing that we saw last time, or the, the time before last time. So here is an example of an abstract class. Um, that's why it has its name. It has this virtual or pure virtual method called print name, which again does not take any parameters and doesn't give anything. But this way is showing this abstract class has particular things that are valuable, that are already making a particular class. But if anyone wants to then use this, these attributes, for instance, or the methods that would be in this class, they just have to derive this, but they are forced to implement this particular thing, this particular method called print name. So if a derived class wants to use all the information that is in abstract or kind of wants to inherit from abstract class, then they need to overwrite uh, this print name methods. And here you can see this, we can explicitly do this by saying overwrite. It's also something that we've already seen in the polymorphism chapter. Um, overwrite is basically saying I, I explicitly overwrite the print name. And if you then mistyped print name, you said print aim, for instance, then the uh, compiler knows that something is wrong here. You wanted to override a function or a method print aim, but this is not there in the, in the class you inherit from. Right? So that is the only reason why you would have overwrite over here. Um, and, you, uh, and, and they don't, I mean, they can be duplicated and typically you can write them whatever, wherever they make sense. And typically may people do that. Same like const in this case. Uh, this is a function or a method that does not change any of the local attributes because there aren't any. Right, and this way I can uh, create an object uh, from this class that is perfectly fine. If I would have tried to create an object of the abstract class, I would have gotten an error because this object does not have print name. And that is the underlying reason. So that is what um, an abstract class in principle is. Um, override we've seen is uh, an extra keyword. That's something uh, that I just told you. Um, final can also be done. So if you have a larger framework where classes inherit from classes, inherit from classes, and one of the top classes is, for instance, an abstract class, then it might take a while before this particular method gets uh, overridden um, and before it gets really implemented. But it could be that you don't want then other classes, other child classes of this particular class, to be doing the same again. In that way, that way you can say final. That means uh, starting from this class, no subclass can override this class anymore. It's in a way to protect the implementation of a particular method. And usually also there it makes sense to do this higher up in the hierarchy or in the inheritance chain rather than lower up. If you allow everyone to overwrite uh, most of the methods in abstract classes, it might get also quite, um, quite chaotic very soon. And this final keyword allows you to, to forbid this so that every developer that comes after you is not allowed to inherit from your class and override these methods. That's what final says. All of these are optional, they're not necessary, uh, but you allow them what can be used and reused later on. Uh, that is um, uh, a personal choice, even sometimes. Good, here's an example where we have a base class. We have only uh, one particular uh, function in this case, um, where we, uh, this is not an abstract class, this is a normal class. Mm -hmm. Um, and where we, we can print uh, whatever we want. So in this case, we, create, uh, we print base class and we inherit from base class derive class, which then overrides the print uh, methods and then writes the write class. And then this little exercise shows you what can happen or in which cases what is possible. So we can create a base class object, we can create a derived class object. You know, this is not an abstract class, so that is not a problem. We can also create references. Uh, to both of them, that's what we do over here. And then for the references, then we can create, uh, we can uh, print uh, what uh, methods uh, there are. And, and here I think there's not really a um, uh, uh, surprise. These are references, that means these are just other names for base and derived, uh, as you probably remember. We can, however, also have a pointer um, to a base, from a base class and we can uh, give those the addresses of either the base class or the derived class. Uh, that's something we can do. Sorry, yes? Uh, 
After they have been assigned to something, yes. Uh, I think, wait, 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 no, 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 no. So basically the point, that's something we will see in a few slides from now, in fact, yes. But that's a good point. So basically if you have a base class, I mean, no, we'll see the uh, example of uh, the structure in a second. But the same works for methods, yeah. And then we'll see the polymorphism example again, where we do explicitly that, right? But right. the methods do need to be overridden from a base class. Right. Yeah. Otherwise we can't actually it wouldn't make sense, exactly. You know, in this case, we basically just, we know that we have something of a type base class, yeah. and on, only that allows us to do particular things. Yeah. Right, so we have a pointer. Uh, both, or we have two pointers. Both pointers are uh, pointing to an object of uh, the class base class. But in this case, we also uh, give it the address of the derived class. That is what this means. And as we saw with the polymorphism example two weeks ago, um, this is possible, right? So in this case, we, um, we can also then uh, um, call the print methods. Uh, we have to do that in this way because they are pointers. Remember that. And in this case, they will be different because the base class or, or this class over here is pointing to the base class. Uh, this class uh, object over here is pointing to the derived class. So here it will say derived class. Here it will say base class. What you can, of course, also do is then explicitly say for the, um, the references that we created over here, the print and over, over there, when you go for explicit cast, um, casting of the base class, you basically um, uh, give the print uh, method over here. And this is something you can do, but not the other way around. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, and then an example for final, because that was um, the override uh, example basically here. So here we explicitly override it, but we could have left it out and all of this would be exactly as we, as, as we promised. Right? <laughs> so the override keyword over here um, just make sure that, the C, that C++ um, knows that this is an overridden class. And if anything is a bit dodgy, then, uh, or a mistake is made, or somebody changes the base class in some way, then it will over here say, I was expecting a, a method to be overridden, but I didn't find this particular method print. And that is then an easier error than what you might have gotten if somebody would have changed the base class, for instance. And it's, it's to prevent errors later on. Okay, uh, for final, very similar example. We have, uh, in this case, an abstract class. We derive from that a derived class where we have uh, a method that has exactly the same name, but this time an implementation, and where we explicitly say we override it. And then from this class, we derive another class which we call final class because, in this case, we override that method yet again, but in, but. Uh, insist that this is the final time that it has been overridden. And that all works. What doesn't would or what wouldn't work is if you then der uh, derive from that another class called another class where you would try to do that again. So if you would, for instance, over here again, try to override the print name methods um, and uh, also here could have said final or override, it would have been a, a problem. Or C++ stops compiling because here you said final. And that's what will be in the, was, uh, what will be in the, in the error in that case. Okay? All right. What did I want to say here? I just have to recapture this. Um, right. So, uh, W this is this is an example of what happens to uh, destructors. Oh, sorry, you have an ex uh, a question? Yeah, exactly. So whenever you have virtual, you can use override as well. And you don't have to use them all the time together. That is the point. But if you're doing one, I would uh, suggest to do the other one as well because it's making more explicit what your target is or what your goals are. 
If you say, I want to overwrite print name from the base class, then you can actually also mention override there, I would say. Uh, some, I mean, C++ is usually quite verbose, but in this case, I would uh, say it doesn't hurt to write, even in that case, both virtual and overrides. And final, if you really want that to be the final methods. Another question? Just formulate one if you have one. <laughs> All right, so in this illustration, I have a base class. And the base class has a destructor. Man, no, note that this is the, the destructor of this particular base class, which will then show whenever this uh, thing is, is, de is deleted or if the function it, the object was in is uh, terminated, then you know, this thing is, um, or these statements are being executed. Then we have our derived class from our base class where we do exactly the same. Now, this is just to kind of confirm, if you create a pointer to the base class and you instantiate that as an object of the derived class, as we've done a few times by now, and you delete this base class pointer, then what it will, act, or what, that, what, what it will be uh, printed in the uh, console is that the base class destructor has been executed, but not the derived class. And that is to, I think, your question, right, earlier. This, is, this is, the, is something that you would expect. It basically means that the structures are not inherited. It's not that, um, that, you that automatically or magically C++ knows that it needs to then also call the destructor of the derived class because you have a pointer that points to the base class. And that is all that C++ is operating from. Right? That, is, that is the point. So keep that in mind for the next slide. So a virtual destructor in this case can counter this. So in this case, we have exactly the same. So I mean, this is perhaps for some people not very nice or not or counterintuitive. If you have something, an object of derived class, and you delete this, you would want to, do, uh, to also have the destructor of the derived class being called, right? So that's what you would want. It's not the case because you have uh, this uh, line over here. Uh, base is a pointer to the base class, not to the derived class. But you can, with the keyword virtual, do this explicitly for your destructors. So if you have a virtual destructor in this case, so the only thing that changed for the base class is that our destructor is virtual, and for the derived class as well. Nothing else has changed. But with this virtual, Remember the late binding principle that we talked about last time? Um, I've linked it in the slides if you want to uh, um, uh, read it again. So basically it allows C++ to think a little bit ahead and look at uh, when uh, this destructor is bound and then suddenly this works. If we then create an object of our base class or a pointer to an object of our base class and then create the act as an actual object an object of the derived class and delete that, then both um, will be deleted. So you will see that first the derived class destructor is being called and then the base class destructor is being called, which in most cases you would want to have. Yes? It depends. Okay, yeah, it depends on what you want, what you have, of course, in this derived class. But I mean, if you think of the generic way you want the structure to behave when you have a particular object of that class, say that you have linked lists in there or something that you instantiated into memory while at runtime, then those things are not getting deleted, right? If, if you have here a dynamic array that is quite big, then that is stuck into memory, and that's what you want to remove, and that is not what is happening yeah. here. Uh, why would you want to? Okay, yeah, sorry. So yeah. Why would, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't the neighbor, Why would it not always be implemented this yeah, way? Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, absolutely the right question because this makes, of course, more sense. I thought you meant the other way around. Um, this is basically the way C++ knows which. Um, uh, so when you overload functions or overload methods, then C++ needs to do extra work whenever it's uh, whenever these these things over here happen, right? And finding this out could create, or is basically going into your resources. 
So C++ does things by its own. It looks uh, you know, towards the derived class. And this way, it does not. It basically says um, an object of base class is deleted, so we call that the structure, everything is fine. In really big hierarchies, this would mean that C++ would have to go all the way down and find out which particular destructor to call. And that is, of course, a little bit of overhead. And in most of the cases, you're absolutely right. This would be negligible, and this is the way then to do it with the virtual keyword in front of the destructor. But in the way C++ creates these V tables um, and, and basically um, uh, needs to find out you know, which uh, object it is talking about, um, it does create or it does take resources like time, operations, that if, if you're a programmer that is a little bit, you know, taking care of these, you would want to avoid. And by default, C++ does it this way. Yeah. Okay, but now you know how to kind of uh, go around this. So you basically just use a virtual destructor if you use this particular thing. And then everything will be fine. Another nice thing that I think is um, kind of a continuation of what we've seen in the polymorphism chapter are non-virtual interface, uh, non interfaces. Now you might also know interfaces from other programming languages. Again, interfaces do exist in Java, but they're not a special keywords. So an interface is basically just an abstract class where every method is a pure virtual method and where you don't have local attributes. And if you do, then it's a class attribute, you know, it has static, and it is basically a constant. So that, that's, if you have that, then you have an interface, um, and which is like the most purest way of uh, creating an abstract class. You basically say this class does, is, does not only have uh, any objects, but it also is used only to derive classes from and tell those which form they should follow. And that's, what the, that's why also why they call this an interface. Um, and also here, we um, revisit virtual again with polymorphism. So that's where we saw polymorphism for the first time. Remember, we had this example where we wanted to have uh, a pointer to a base class animal. That was like the abstract class. And we then specify this pointer as pointer to a more concrete class, like that of a dog or a fish. And if I then call the methods belonging to those, they will do ex exactly what we wanted. Like they would call the method of the dog or they would call the method of the fish. And, this, and because of that, uh, print out something different because the, the function of animal or the method uh, print of animal was virtual. And that's also where we saw this late binding approach. So that's what we did. And this is what the code looked like. This is just revisiting it. We have our base class animal. Um, there's loads of things happening. The most important thing, however, is this virtual keyword over here. And the fact that we have here a particular method, it is implemented. So this is, of course, also not an abstract class. But this method can be overloaded um, uh, or overridden by, um, uh, by child methods. So we have a uh, child class dog, which again has exactly the same methods, uh, but does something different. And we call in this case also override to make this explicit. This print needs, is an overridden method from an earlier class or from a parent class. Uh, the same we do for that fish, exactly the same. And because of that, if we have then uh, object pointers to the base class animal, we can at will or at runtime even uh, assign them to particular types of animals, as many as we'd like, even uh, the base class. Um, and we can then also randomly select one of those and let them uh, invoke their print methods. Just to show that this is, you know, at runtime selected, randomly selected, which animal is now uh, invoking or calling its print methods. And this print methods, even though A over here is an animal, right, a pointer to an animal object, is always the right one. Yeah, yeah, this is not an interface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it should, well, it should not have concrete members. So an interface is defined, I mean, in Java, because there's no definition in C++ about interface. But in Java, for instance, or in UML, an interface is defined as a class that has only pure virtual functions or methods, 
And if it has an attribute, it must be a class attribute. That means it must be static and it must be constant. So those are the... the Yes, if, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an interface is even more strict than an abstract class. But an abs uh, so an interface is an abstract class, but not the other way around. Yeah. Did I say it otherwise? Yeah, In that case, slap on my wrist. Yes. Okay. And this is not uh, has nothing to do yet with interfaces, and it won't have anything to do with an interface class, by the way. Just just to to make that clear. This non-virtual interface is coming up still because this is just repeating what we have already done and it shows the, the power of polymorphism because this A can be pointing at a dog or a fish or a generic animal and this print method is always the right one that gets invoked. Right? That is the nice thing. What is not so nice, however, about this is that you do duplicate quite a lot. If you look at that print method over here, it always starts with this STDC out and then your string, which is always quite specific to the class, of course, and then this enter over here. So there's a little bit of duplication, and that is, that is one thing that might uh, not be so well. The other thing is that, it's, that there's no control, really, from the animal class point of view, what is happening in the child classes. So some silly developer could come and add some other animal, derive this from animal as well, could override this class and do something really, really dangerous or security breaching dangerous, right? The, the full control of the developers are here to the developers that are implementing those classes. So the class animal could have been developed by one person and the class dog by another person. And in this case, they, you know, they probably communicated because they're doing very similar things, but it doesn't have to happen. Right? The only thing that is really necessary for a function to be overridden or a method to be overridden is that the signature needs to be correct. So that in this case, the method needs to be named print. It does not have any uh, parameters and it uh, does not return anything. Right? That's the only thing that we have control over if we are the ones writing this animal class. But anyone who could come then afterwards and then create another class that derives from our class could do anything in this print method. And sometimes that is also quite dangerous. So those are the two reasons why this is not perhaps the ideal way to implement this. Here is though, again in text, you know, so that you can read this. And um, the answer to this is the non-virtual interface idiom. So basically the way we've done it up until now is a public virtual method called print that we overwrite in the child classes. The nice thing about that is it's easy, and it's easy to explain what this is, and that's how, why I did it that way. But there is a uh, lot of repetition of code, perhaps, and typically this is the case, because if you have a method that then is, uh, needs to be overridden, then those child classes typically do very similar things. And then the code in those child classes will probably reflect a lot from the code of that base class. And that could happen, a lot, that, that there's quite a lot of duplicity here in your code. The same um, is that there is no guarantees what print does further down the line. So as, you, as other classes inherit from you or from your class, um, then that print method might be doing loads of other things. So there's not really that, that much control. And that is why the non-virtual interface is an idiom that is often used uh, that is actually making this possible. It is making this public virtual function private and it, uh, or it is basically relying upon uh, a part of that function becoming private and then calling that private function in a public um, uh, function. That is basically the way it is working. And the best way to do that is by, again, revisiting the, exa the example. And then you know, note the differences. It's very hard because almost everything is still the same, apart from the fact that in this case, our print statement is still public, right? is doing a little bit of a different thing. It's uh, always printing something out. And what it's printing out is then dictated by this get sound uh, private virtual uh, method or function. And is this function or method is um, returning a string. And the string is what is being, being printed. Now, this is definitely then also not duplicating um, whatever we've done before, because that is over here. What we have to do whenever we have an animal uh, uh, child class 
is that we overwrite the private virtual method get sounds and we can't access or we can't do anything about the print uh, or we typically don't do that. If you don't want any developers to do this, what keyword do you put here? Final, exactly. So in that case, other developers that are inheriting from your class can only then overwrite the get sounds private methods and it needs to return a string which you then output, which is a lot more controlling than the previous example. Right? So the only thing that in this case the print method can, be, can do is in that case print something out to the console and, and, and nothing else. And this is then defined by this particular method. So this is what is, the, what is done in dog. So also the dog is now a method that overrides uh, the get sound method uh, from, the, from its parents and returns a string, just like we've done in the previous one. And the same we do for fish. So also the fish class overrides the get sound private method in this case and then returns this particular string. They don't implement this print, this public print method anymore. And here we have exactly the same. So over here, nothing changes. <coughs> uh, we don't even need, in this case, uh, uh, C++ to be smart about the print methods. The print method, however, will be smart enough to call the right get sounds method. Right? That is the point here. So within uh, the print method, the right get sounds uh, private virtual function is being used. And that is called non-virtual interface. So it's a little bit more elegant or more controlling as well as the example that we've seen or the typical polymorphism example that we saw before. Any questions about this? Yes? Uh, is there a reason why uh, this private tool for this uh, function and not uh, for semantic methods and not uh, protected? Um, that's so a good question. The animal class, yes. Um, no, no, you don't have to override if it's virtual, but in this case we want to, right? Yeah. We want to override this particular function mm -hmm. because we don't want every dog to say I'm dog okay. in that case, right? So that's, that is what in this case we want to do. It would, be, it would be possible, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be, but private is even more cons constructive, right, or constricted. So basically this get sound cannot be accessed, because it's private, by any other, not even child classes. And I think it's a security thing, basically. That means if we really make our class open and other people can derive from our class, then they can overwrite this get sound class um, but they can't call it, for instance. And that might have particular advantages in security. I mean, I can, I can understand the, the question, because in this case, we see the code. You know, all of that code is ours. And I mean, in real projects, people see all the code as well, but it's divided between different people. And there's usually a separation of concerns there. Um, and, I, and, I th and I think here, in this case, it definitely could have also been protected. Uh, or. Or we could also have gone for the previous example. Um, but I think it is really to make sure that no one can call this particular method outside the class. So, and, and the only reason, or the only reason why this method ever gets called is because of this print method. Right? So that's, it's locking down this particular thing to the maximum. Yeah. But it's a good observation. Yeah, that's... That's a good point. And of course, if, if only the only thing that you're worried about is about the duplication of codes, then of course that would not be one of the worries. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, so basically you decouple a class public interface, and this has nothing to do with interface classes. Um, um, so you, in that case, it's not a, you have a public method print, but what you overwrite for specific animals in that case is a protected or a private, and usually it's private, um, method that is then uh, overriding, for instance, the get sound class, as we've seen here. This is called an idiom. This is not to be, or this is a little bit um, like um, 
design patterns. So idioms are guidelines. There's a couple of links to this if you want to read up about this. Um, and there's loads of idioms, there's loads of uh, design patterns. Some of them I will see still this week and next week. Okay, then finally, when we want to revisit virtual for another reason is uh, because of multiple inheritance. And here, again, um, other languages typically don't allow multiple inheritance um, because of this diamond problem. You might have heard about it already. Um, I think I quickly go to... Now, I'll, I'll just do it uh, in sequence. So in Java, you have interfaces that I've already said. In C++, you don't. Um, but uh, you can do, actually, inheritance of any classes, and you can have multiple of those. Um, and if you do this, then you might uh, wonder what happens then to the constructors and the destructors, because if you have then an inherited class of multiple classes, then you will have multiple constructors being immediately uh, called as well. So if you have class A being the base class, um, and class B as well, that's also a base class, both of them to the derived class, and you inherit to class A and class B, then the sequence of this over here matters for seeing which constructor is called first. So in this case, a class A's constructor is called first, and then class B's constructor. And when, it's, when this object of class derived class is destroyed, then the other, other way around. Then first the destructor of class B is uh, called, then the destructor of class A. Um, and you can see that here, or by, uh, by implementing this, you can see it in what is printing out, at least for the constructors. And for the destructors, you could do exactly the same, of course. So that's what you have to know, or that's one of the few things you really have to know about multiple inheritance. But what is another uh, thing that people then immediately raise is if you inherit from multiple classes, you might uh, arrive in the diamond problem, which is if you have class A, and child class B of A, and child class C of A, and then you have class D, which then inherits from both B and C, then which, of, uh, which aspects will be here, right? Because it inherits from here and, and, and from here, right? So if, there's a, if they both inherit a method M from a class A, then which of those methods is being called? And that is then, uh, uh, it has multiple names, but a diamond problem is usually what people uh, call this. And what really mat or what matters is that this is really the way it looks like. You're having, whenever you have multiple inheritance, you have then, in fact, two grandparent classes objects available to you. And which one you call depends on which uh, path you take, the left one or the right. So you basically have, in this case, this is an example where you might have thought, uh, a faculty a per is a person, uh, somebody from faculty is a person, somebody that is a student is also a person, and if I have a PhD student, this might be both a student as well as a faculty person. Um, but then this PhD student, in this particular way of thinking, is then both uh, or two persons at the same time. On the one time, it's a person that is a faculty, and on the uh, uh, side, it's a person that is a student. Um, so it, it will have two copies. And in many cases, that is OK. You know, that, is, that is perfectly fine. Uh, in, that, in that case, you just have to get rid of this picture, this diamond picture, because that is what you thought might happen, but it's not the case. Whenever you do multiple inheritance, and those uh, classes inherit from other classes yet again, then you basically inherit those classes twice. Or you basically have two objects uh, in your object of PhD students that are both ob uh, person objects. Okay, that is, that is what is happening. And that you can fix again by our virtual keyword. So if you virtually inherit from a person, um, then you tell C++ to think ahead whenever uh, uh, multiple inheritance is happening, for instance. And in that case, really, there will be only one person. So this is, yet again, uh, virtual, the virtual keywords uh, being used or reused again in C++ to overcome this particular problem. And very similar to the overriding, it is giving C++ more power to search a bit further, but it comes, of course, at a cost, at a bit of overhead, because C++ needs to figure out whether those have indeed both a person, faculty and students. And that 
ha has a particular cost. So that is called virtual inheritance. And um, also there, there is a group of people that says you should just avoid it at all costs anyway, this multiple inheritance. But there's other people that do say that there's uh, good examples where this works perfectly. And uh, typical for C++, you can choose whatever you want here, right? You could do this. And in some cases, I can imagine that it does lead to very interesting implementations. Um, templated interfaces. Okay, this is just an example. Um, so basically, we can combine our, um, uh, our class or inheritance with templates. And this is an example of that. So in this case, um, we have uh, a pure virtual function called print item yet again. And we use also template over here for making sure that this item does not have to be an integer or a character or a particular class that we want to have this bound with. We basically use therefore an item so that we, uh, a, a T as a template so that this item could be any type of template. And in this case, when we inherit from this menu item as an item, and we want to, for instance, um, uh, or because we have here um, a pure virtual function, we are forced to implement this eventually. So that's what we do over here. We can then implement this right over here. So this is a possible way to involve or to template uh, whatever we've seen or the things that we've seen earlier as well. So you could abstract the data type here away from the methods, just like we saw with the containers. Um, and then you can do certain things, you know, for instance, with um, integers or with characters um, or with strings or with whatever type of class you would like, right? So those are some examples of an interface uh, where, or no, not an interface, sorry, where an, an, a, menu, uh, a menu that is either a menu of uh, numbers, a menu of characters, or a menu of strings. And we can at runtime decide and implement those things. With, inter uh, with templates. Okay, that's it. Okay, you could read, oh, that's another thing that is um, quite interesting. Since um, C++ 17, you can shorten quite a lot of things. We've seen already uh, this particular for loop that makes it much, uh, much smaller. Uh, the same for templates. So, so there, templates are often regarded as a little bit uh, big because your code gets very overwhelmingly complex. But if you compare this, because this is how you should do it in C++11 or earlier, but if you uh, have then C++17 onwards, then you, templates are, um, or the uh, arguments of templates are then being uh, derived. So depending on what type of items we have here, this is obviously an integer, because those are constant integers. In that case, C++ knows exactly what we have over here and knows exactly what type of template we'll have over here. The same for here, these are characters. Same for here, these are obviously strings because we tell C++ explicitly here that those are strings, right? So that's the nice thing and it makes the whole code a lot shorter. Okay, then finally, I want to see a couple of things that are on the margin that you might see sometimes, but that I think are not at the core of C++. That's why I waited so long with uh, seeing them. The first one is enumerators. You probably have already seen those in C. If you have already have C, uh, seen C or C++ in the introductory course, an enumerator is basically a way to link constants to an integer. So you can do this with the enum keywords. You can give this then uh, uh, a name. You don't always have to. Anonymous enumeration also um, exists. And then basically you enumerate a, a, a set of constants. And these constants are exactly that. Those are constants that from now on, whenever you define them, are, uh, are, are, can be used as a constant of this particular type. That's why I have this underscore t here, so you can see this is, or this can be used as a type. So I can then have, for instance, a variable danger of this particular type, um, and I can tell them the danger is high, for instance. And that is a nice thing, and in, especially in embedded systems, these things get used all the time. Because in the end, it is reusing integers and making sure that the code is a lot more readable. But that is all. In the background, this is an integer constant, this is an integer constant, it is an integer constant. And, we, and the way C++ works, or C even, we know that this is a 0, this is a 1, and this is a 2. 
Uh, so that's all that C++ does here. And the cool thing is that if you only take a couple or you can reassign them yourself. So if you say, I want to have a full battery, have the value 100, an adequate battery, adequate is not entirely nice, but 50 and an empty battery zero, then I can also specify this myself. Um, I can also have negative values and leave things out. In that case, C++ just does plus one. So medium will then be minus 99, high will be uh, minus 98. Or if I have multiple and I only label the last one, it will retrack. You know, it will basically say Monday is one, Tuesday is two, and so on. Saturday is six, and Sunday is seven. Right? So that is how, for decades, enum worked in C and C++. The advantage of enum is only that it makes the code uh, much more easier to read. You don't have to um, define particular constants and then reuse those. You can basically say, I have an enumeration. Uh, I use this particular name for this enumeration, and it can take those particular values. There is, however, no checking that you then uh, assign a humidity to 99, for instance. Right? So there's, uh, uh, although in the background we have integers, and we know this, um, it, it might do something completely different. But if you deal with this, and if you see this code, then it is quite nice and readable. Because of the constants being readable, first of all, only and of those being... Um, yeah, low in number, but you know, basically you have those as enumeration of things that make sense. And you don't have to go to the, to the identifiers that are below those constants. You don't have to know the values. Um, but this might be leading to sometimes problems, because you could have, for instance, um, a level concept in one case and a battery concept in the other case. In that case, you might not be able to use the low because they can, they can be only used once, right? So you can have, in this particular scope, only one constant that is called low. So therefore, we can't have a low battery. Then I renamed it to empty. That also works. But that is one uh, specific limit. The other limit is, since they are integers, you can do anything with those status 1 and status 2 um, variables that you want. You can, for instance, combine them, and then if one is low and the other one is full, then they will be empty. Uh, however, if one is low and the other one is empty, then they will uh, then then they will be the same. I mean, and if one is low and one of the one is empty, they will def uh, definitely be different, uh, because low is zero, empty is two, and that is not so nice. And so you could get confused after a while if you use multiple enumerations, and because of that. C++11 introduced scoped enumerations. The advantage is you can now have a type-safe way of enumerating. So if you do it that way, and this is uh, by just adding the class keywords, and also there, lots of people are rolling with their eyes typically when they've seen this because this is not a class. This is just another key or reusing the class keyword together with enum to, sh to share that this is a scoped enumeration. But in that case, the only way to get to this low over here, once we have, for instance, um, a variable of this new type, uh, where this type is now really not an integer, or it's, it's basically something separate than an integer, then we have to explicitly say this, that status 1 is now, in this case, a low of, the ta of, uh, of a level enumeration. Or in this case, for the battery, that it's uh, <coughs> the empty uh, of our battery enumeration. Right, so that would, uh, leaving out this, the, uh, these would uh, definitely lead to an error as well. And you would not be able to compare them, but you would also not be able to print them out to the console. So every, uh, that those are the nice things, or the nice short things. You can't think about these things anymore as an integer. You can, however, override this yet again, and you can say, I want, for instance, explicitly an 8-bit integer for this. So in that case, you save four, uh, no, three bytes, so instead of a four-byte integer, you now have a one-byte integer, and you say, I want to have, to have this as the value 0, 1, 2, and 3, so that fits. Right? So that is a possibility where you can explicitly then say what the scoped enumeration is using. Right, um, and, and this can't be done then, as I said to you. So you can't output then uh, this particular thing anymore to the console, because our C out and our operator over here do not know what you have, right? That is, that is the problem that for uh, typical scoped enumerations is not possible. And it was nice for the normal enumeration because there you would just see the number, the underlying number of uh, low, medium, and high. 
Um, what you can do since C++20 um, is leave out this level colon colon over here. For instance, if you have these type of examples where you want to then print out low, medium and high as an actual string somewhere, then you have to retype this all the time. You don't have to do this if for your current scope you're saying using enum level. And in that case, level is given for low, medium and high already. That's just on the sides. This is definitely so not something that you really have to um, use because all of that has been superseded by uh, class and by other things. So there is a way in, um, uh, in C and C++ to group variables or objects of classes together into one structure. And that is exactly the same that a class does as well. Right? So that's what a class does. The only difference between a struct and a class or there's, there's two, but the main difference is that whenever you don't specify here public or private, and you could do this in uh, C++, then they're by default public. Uh, that means this over here is a structure that, create, that has created now a member attribute a student ID and one that is great. Um, and those are now packed together in a class and on an exam entry. And it's a class, really, but in um, old-fashioned C, this used to be a struct. Uh, that, uh, I mean, class is kind of uh, superseding um, the struct entry. So this is exactly the way uh, we would write this for a class as well. The reason why sometimes structs are still being used is that you don't have to, I mean, if you have a very small class where you know everything is going to be public anyway, then struct is, of course, a shorter way of writing it. And that's the only reason why you might sometimes see this. Uh, that, that, uh, instead of saying class and on exam entry, and then having to uh, go to the new line and then spend an entire line on just uh, public colon, that you can do leave away and you just say, uh, instead of class, you say structs. That's the only thing. There's a couple more. Inheritance is the other way around, for instance. The, if you do public, um, or private inheritance, then the behavior is a little bit different as well, but those are just niche things, and I doubt that anyone would really need a struct um, if they already have a class as a keyword. Same for typedef. Typedef is a way in C++ to define a new um, or a, an, an, um, an alternate name for a, a type. So you could say, from now on, I don't, don't want to use integer, uh, int, but integer, then you can do this with typedef. And then you basically can also replace int with integer from now on, and then i is then an integer, which is an int. That's something what we said right over here. And because of that, sometimes you will see in C++ code, older C++ code still, that people use structs together with typedefs because in the old days of C, you would not be able to say, if this was your structure, um, this I want now um, an uh, an entry that is my object of type anon anonymous exam entry, that is my class or my struct, that would not be possible. You would have to imp uh, have the suffix struct in front of this. And this is again a little bit too long and because of that people usually then compress this together with typedef where they say I want struct exam entry to be the same from now on as exam entry. That you might sometimes see in code but if you don't, be happy about that. You don't have to worry about that. Last thing I wanted to see are unions and a new way of using unions. So unions might be a very good thing to know if you're going into microcontroller programming and if you have to worry about every byte that you're spending. Uh, a union is the same like a class, yet again, or a structure. The only difference is that the attributes in that, in that uh, union are overwriting themselves. There is basically the size of this uh, union number over here is the size of the longest thing that you see of those three things, which will be long, I would say. Oh, double is exactly the same size, I think. But for a class, for instance, in this case, a long would be, I think, eight bytes. An unsigned integer would be four bytes. And a double would be eight bytes again. So that would be 20 bytes in total, right? For, for a union, uh, you would have eight bytes reserved because that is the longest that you would need. And a number can either take this L or this U or this F. None of the above at the same time. 
And that is the tricky thing, but it's also the nice thing. So basically you can say, I have myself a number, then you specify whether it is a long, an unsigned, or a double, and then later it will have exactly the same effect, or you can use it as such. But there will be overwriting, right? So if you have a number n over here, and you say, I want the attributes L of my number n, which is a long, to be 7. That is an L, not an, uh, a 1. Um, and then I output this, then, I, then it will output 7 indeed. If I, will, if I do this again for the float, then it will output the float, but, and that doesn't, doesn't show this, this, this example is not showing this, what will also happen is that the 7 is removed from memory. So this 8.9 has overwritten this 7 over here. There was a question in the back? Mm -hmm. and you use yeah. Yeah. No, it's the same the same number of bytes, so, so but but if if it was less, right? You could also say it was less. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So, yeah, that's a good question. So the memory does not shrink. So C++ in its pre-compilation phase already looks at how big this particular number will be. And it will take the biggest that is possible. But the nice thing is it will only then take the 8 bytes and not the 20 bytes that you would have for a class here. That is the nice thing here. But there's total overwriting. So that it's not like you, if you would have a car here, which is just one byte, right? Um, could you get still remnants of this long? No, it basically just overwrites everything. Yeah. But the nice thing is, of course, you can squash a lot of things into one structure or one union, um, and those could be looked at in different ways. That is another way you could look at it. Right? Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Will it look at a type or not is your question really, Lan, right? It, it, it will still say something like there is nothing. And if you make n dot L, there is nothing anymore, right? This might be one thing. I mean, we can try this. We have, I mean, I have this here. I just have to go to the right directory and we'll do this. Because this is indeed also a nice, nice question. So I have this, basically. Um, what if I look at n of l, right? I mean, my or I think what could happen, this is, might also be compiler specific, or maybe there are regulations that uh, forbid this, is that you will still get access uh, to the bits that are being placed in this union, but they are, of course, interpreted as a double. It's completely different. This is this IEEE. And it will then probably result in a gigantic number. Or there will be an error, because it knows that the type is different. Those are the two things that are happening, that might happen. Let's see. No error so far. Gigantic error, <laughs> a gigantic number. Cool, yeah. But very good, good question. Yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. So the exponent and, and so basically all the parts that are all the bits that are in the union um, are still there. That means you can still read them as a float later on. Um, there's also no checking of the type. That is also quite interesting, cool in a way. Um, but this is then the, in, the long interpretation of exactly the same bits. Yeah, but this can literally take like many like the only type type is like For instance, yes. Yeah, th I mean, there are lots of other things you can do here as well. There is also bit fields, for instance. That is, again, a, a struct thing. But um, I don't want to go too deep into all of these. We can go very far. Um, but I mean, just remember that unions are also a very old construct, you know, from the C days. And in that case, you had to s spare every byte. And this is why a union was uh, indeed very useful. At the moment, I think there is not that much use for a union anymore. 
Yes, or maybe you prove me wrong. Yeah, um, you made mention that it's kind of like good for like embedded programming and, and yeah. Um, do you think that like probably to do some kind of work one might actually utilize you know embedded programming really much? Well, what we, we, what you, we just talked about. So basically, you can have uh, three variables here as part of a structure or a class. Even you can think about this. It is kind of a class, right? But these things are, um, as you initialize them, chosen and stored in these attributes. But then you can read other attributes. And I mean, basically, these things are stored on top of each other, not next to each other. So the, the thing is that you can that you can instantiate. I mean. The, the main uh, advantage is that you can have a number, you can then choose which of those different viewpoints of this number you're going to take. Is this a long, is this a floating point, or is this something else? And then you can choose how to use this number. And it is not having the disadvantages of a class, because if you would do this with a class, then it would create 20 bytes. Here it's only 4 bytes, uh, no, 8 bytes. Right, so. It's, it saves you a few bytes, and in many cases, or in some cases, this might be um, an advantage. In other cases, perhaps not. Right, and then to conclude, because it's almost getting time, um, unions have also been superseded in C17 by uh, variants. So, so there, an, an example, but I think you kind of already can expect, you basically have a variant which is templated, so you can have one or multiple um, parameters uh, in the template. So you can have a character or a string or whatever. And an S in this case is something that can take the form of either a string or a character or whatever you add to this. So to just demonstrate this, I just say I want the S to be a variant between these two different types. I choose now S to be a character. This works. And then with the visit, okay, visit is a, a function that is um, similar to the transform, like it's, it's, it's following the visitor pattern, design pattern. So it uh, translates for us what we do with uh, what is in S. And what we do within S is uh, it looks at the lambda function over here and executes it for uh, what is in S. So we basically take the content of S and print this to the console. Uh, this is a little bit convoluted perhaps, but this is the way to do this in the visit pattern. And it will allow us to do this also if S is a string. So whether S is in a character or F is a string, we basically can then output uh, the content of S in the right way, um, because in this case, the out does know what type it is. Um, and this allows us to store multiple different types using one particular variable only. And that's what they call a variant. Okay? Again, this is just one example of many other things that are in STL. I hope I didn't spoil anyone's 40-line uh, example in this case. Okay, then this was indeed the end of this week. So as I said, next week is the last uh, lecture. If there's any things that you want to have visited, please tell me. Thank you for your attention. We'll see each other next week.